بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم بیک ٹو مائی چینل تھنک بگ لرن اسمارٹ فار مور آف دیز ویڈیوز پلیز لائک کامنٹ شیئر اینڈ سبسکرائب سو ود آؤٹ فردر ڈو لیٹس اسٹارٹ اوور ٹو ڈیز لیکچر ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ ڈیٹرنس تھیوری وی ول بی ڈسکسنگ دی فالوئنگ کمپوننٹس آف دیٹ اٹس ہسٹری کانسیپٹ آزمشنس ٹائپس یوزز and criticisms on deterrence so let's move on first of all we are going to discuss about the history of deterrence well this doctrine gained increased prominence as a military strategy during the cold war with regard to the use of milit- nuclear weapons so from the history we know that the cold war era started after the second world war between the united states of america and the soviet union there were two blocks created the one was the western block of the united states and its european allies and the other was the soviet union as a solid state so there was the rivalry between these two blocks for the world power for gaining the most power well this deterrence gained importance in strategic studies literature through thomas shelling's 1966 classic work on deterrence so in the literary studies it gained importance through thomas shelling's work thomas shelling says the capacity to harm another state is now used as a motivating factor for other states to avoid it and influence another state's behavior so what this point is talking about is that the shelling says that deterrence can be used as a tool for influencing other states behavior then this last point is talking about that there is however no single theory of deterrence if by theory one means a collection of logically connected hypotheses it says that deterrence theory is not a single theory it's a collection of all the similar hypotheses that have the same assumptions underlying in them so let's move on what's the concept of deterrence So for understanding the concept of deterrence we have to know what is deterrence Well the dictionary definition of deterrence is the action of discouraging an an action or event through instilling doubt or fear of the consequences So according to the definition we can know that it's an other name of fear fear in the form of the reaction that the defender state will give to an aggressor state deterrence is a significant theory in strategic studies and in international relations it has a huge importance because nowadays the nuclear weapons impose a lot of threat to other states and in the world as a whole Deterrence gained global recognition chiefly after Cuban missile crisis after that it has been viewed uh, and used as a greatest mediator to attempt influence the decision making of the states so what happened in the Cuban missile crisis Soviet Union placed their nuclear weapons in the Cuba near United States so from these nuclear weapons united states were directly under threat of the attack so soviet union used this ploy for negotiating with the united states on some terms deterrence is implemented and exten- executed to ensure its opponents abide by its will so this point is saying that it is used as a tool for influencing other states deterrence is a belief on strategic cap- capability to avoid or prevent itself from being attacked by its opponents this last point is pretty clear i think i don't have to give an explanation explanation for that 
So what are the assumptions underlying the deterrence? One of the assumptions is rationality. Rationality in terms of thinking. What will the aggressor state get in terms of benefit for by attacking the defender state? It should be a pretty rational decision. Mutual vulnerability means both states are equally able to inflict pain on each other. Cost-benefit analysis. What will be the benefit for this costly venture? These are the underlying assumptions of deterrence. Perceptions are the key. Well, deterrence is all about perceptions. How one state is creating perception about itself in front of other states and in general in the global uh, global arena that will define its deterrent deterrence power credibility is effective for effective function of deterrence well from the credibility means the past experience the past events will de determine what will be the importance of the threat of that particular state's deterrence narrow versus broad concept of deterrence what is that let's see the slide the narrowest definition hold that deterrence refers solely to military tools of statecraft using the threat of military response to prevent a state from taking an action narrow view can be as the use of deterrence only as a military tool for preventing other state to attack the state a broader concept can be that it include threats of economic sanctions diplomatic exclusion or information operations that's the broader concept of deterrence deterrence can be applied through these things as well these two approaches agree with the basic definition that deterrence is dissuasion by means of threat and in many cases for example such as berlin and Cuban missile, Cuban missile crisis, U.S. initiatives to convince the Soviet Union that it would be secure without aggression. That was the use of uh, deterrence in the global arena. So what are the types of deterrence? There are two types of deterrence. One is deterrence by denial and the second is deterrence by punishment. Deterrence by denial is strategies that seek to deter an action by making it infeasible or unlikely to succeed thus denying a potential aggressor confidence in attaining its objectives like there is so much strategy or so much planning being planned that the aggressor state will look at it and being discouraged to attack the other state so it's about creating such a face in front that the other state would fear first to attack you. Threatens by punishment means strategies that threaten threatens severe penalties such as nuclear escalation or economic sanctions if an attack occurs. And one of that example is mutually assured destruction. If both states are nuclear states, then there will be mutually assured destruction if one attacks the other one also attacks and they both will be destroyed so with the threat of punishment no one will cross the line no one will attack first there will be a peace i would say between these two states what are the uses of deterrence deterrence can be used in two circumstances one is direct deterrence and the other is extended deterrence. Direct deterrence can be for a particular state, for a state A, it can be the protection of its own territory from being attacked. That's the direct deterrence. And extended deterrence is involves discouraging attacks on third parties such as its allies or partners. So it is an extended deterrence like for example in the cold war era us prevented soviet union from attacking european countries by making nato that was 
the use of extended deterrence in the Cold War era. What are the conditions for successful deterrence? There are three conditions that are must for successful deterrence. One is the le level of aggressor's mot motivation. Motivation level of aggressor will define if the deterrence will be su successful for any state or it will be a fatal failure. The intentions of potential aggressor are the beginning point for analysis of deterrence, success or failure. If the state sees little reason to undertake aggression, it will not be hard to deter. What this point is saying is that possible motivation to attack can stem from many perceptions, not all of them opportunistic. In fact, the degree to which a potential aggressor is dissatisfied with the status quo is one of the most powerful engines of aggressor's intent and it will define if the deterrence will be successful or not. Clarity about the object of deterrence and actions the defender will take. If if, for example, state A is completely informed about the strategies that will that the other defender state will take if it attacks on them, then it won't attack if it knows that it is beyond their level to respond to that kind of attack. Is that the defender should be as clear as possible about what it is trying to deter as well as what it will do if the threat is ignored clarity of the policies clarity of the strategies and these strategies and policies that i'm talking about these are the strategies and policies of a defender state to let the aggressor state know what will it do if it tries to venture or tries to do any kind of misventure in its territory. Aggressor must be confident that deterring state has capability and will to carry out threats. So if any aggressor knows that the defender state can carry out what it is talking about then can carry out the actions what it is talking about or the strategies that it is it is giving to the world then it won't attack deterrence will be successful so these are the conditions for the successful deterrence what are the criticisms on deterrence well the first criticism is it is argued that societal or psychotic opponents may not be deterred by other forms of deterrence so deterrence fails when the opponent is suicidal or psychotic it wants to attack the enemy at any cost so deterrence won't be useful for that Second, if two enemies both possess nuclear weapons, so I have given the example here, country AX may try to gain first strike advantage by suddenly launching weapons at country Y with view of destroying its enemies' nuclear silos, thereby rendering country Y incapable, incapable of response. So deterrence will fail at that point when the country X have attacked the country Y first. So deterrence failed. That's the second criticism on deterrence. Third is diplomatic misunderstandings. So if a country, a defender state is ambiguous or unsure about its policies and strategies about deterrence, if, about deterrence means it is unsure what it will do in response of any kind of attack, then there is sure way that the deterrence will fail. And it happened in the Cold War era, Cold War era in the Korean War in 1950 and the Iraq Kuwait War in 1990. So these were the criticisms on deterrence. So that was all. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz.